Donald Trump has long suffered from delusions of grandeur. When it comes to his mounting legal issues, he likes to portray himself as a martyr, a victim of political persecution. Just a few months ago, he was comparing himself to a truly historic figure. I'll tell you what, I don't mind being Nelson Mandela because I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it for a reason. We got to save our country from these fascists, these lunatics that we're dealing with. They're horrible people. Nope, 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 no. Now, I could easily go into the countless ways that Trump is nothing like Mandela, but who has the time? And just last night, Trump made yet another inapt comparison. Trump doubled down on his comparison of his criminal and civil prosecutions, including the most recent $355 million civil penalty to the circumstances of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny, the top political opponent to Trump's autocratic pal, Russian President Vladimir Putin, whose name Trump never uttered. Even if, if you appeal, you've got to put up escrow money. That's uh, uh, it's a lot it of dough. It is a, lot a of dough. form of Navalny. It is a form of... Uh, communism or fascism. Navalny is a very sad situation, and he's a br very brave. He was a very brave guy. It's a horrible thing, but it's happening in our country, too. Uh, we are turning into a communist country in many ways, and if you look at it, I'm the leading candidate. I get indicted. I never heard of being indicted before. What in the gobbledygook? Navalny's death in a Russian prison was announced last week. He had been imprisoned since his return to Russia in January 2021 after surviving a near-fatal poisoning months earlier. Whatever Trump said makes absolutely no sense. Joining me now is Jill Weinbanks, former assistant Watergate special prosecutor and an MSNBC legal analyst. Do you understand what he said? No. Okay. I do understand that he missed the comparison. The comparison is him to Putin. His threat that he would use SEAL Team 6 Correct. to kill his opponent? Well... That's what Putin does. He kills his opponents. Exactly. And the, 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 the comparison to Mandela, I won't even go there because it'll just give me agita even attempting to unpack that. Let me let me play you another soundbite of Donald Trump, because part of what he is trying to do with his audience, and they love it, they, they, they accept it, is to say he, he committed no crimes because everything he did, he was allowed to do. He had total immunity to do. Here he is talking about one of the most obvious crimes, taking those classified documents. Here he is talking about that. Why didn't you just hand them over when they were requested, though? I mean, they requested them. You could have just handed them over. It probably I was saved yourself a lot of trouble. First of all, I didn't have to hand them over. But second of all, I would have done that. We were talking, and then all of a sudden they raided Mar-a-Lago. Do you remember? They said, could you put an extra lock on the door? We showed them where they were. We showed them. No. No, no, and no. He said three things there, all of which are false. They put a new lock in. They hid things. They moved things. Then they tried to destroy the videotape of them moving things. He did not have a right to move them. That is, he had no right to retain them. He makes a comparison to Bill Clinton, who kept diaries. So did Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Those are things that are personal and that a president can keep. But all other presidential documents are not to be kept by the former occupant. They aren't intended for that. And that's, it's such clear law. Um, the Presidential Records Act was a result of Richard Nixon, and it makes it very clear mm -hmm. that they are government documents and must be left in the care of the National Archives, not taken as personal possessions. Let, let, let's, let's talk for a moment about Tish James, uh, who is uh, the, the national hero at this point, yes. because she is the one saying not only did she beat Trump uh, in the, 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 doc, the, uh, the civil fraud case, but she says... Give me your properties. You're either going to pay yeah. or you're going to give me your properties. What do you make of that? I, she's absolutely right. He has to come up with the money. He's been a judge to have been a fraud. And the judgment is a huge judgment. He cannot appeal unless he posts cash in about mm, 500 million almost because of interest accruing daily. Mm -hmm. Or he has to put up his own money. So he has to pay a bond which means extra interest, or he has to put up his own money. And if he fails to do that, the judgment becomes judgment-proof. He has to pay it. Yeah. And so she's prepared to seize his property, and she will be able to do that. Um, she can put liens on it to collect it, but she has more power than just you and I as citizens. If right. we needed, you know, a contractor like a doesn't do the job. Agency. Yes, yeah. exactly. She can actually seize the buildings and remove the words Trump 
and the value goes up as soon as those words come down. That's true. You're here in Chicago. You saw Trump Tower. That's right. And it's an offense every time you walk past that. Yeah. As soon as the name comes down, the value of the properties actually go up, 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 up. Let me play you uh, Donald Trump's typical defense for everything he uh, does. He says it's perfect. Here it is. You borrow a small amount of money by comparison. You pay it back. The bank is in love with you. This was a perfect loan. I got impeached, and it was a perfect call to the president of Ukraine. But we made perhaps an even more perfect call to the secretary of state of Georgia, which is my right. Let me tell you about the travel ban. We had a very smooth rollout of the travel ban. The rollout was perfect. But our border was perfect. I'm back because I'm a perfect physical specimen, and I'm extremely young. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a silly defense, <laughs> but I guess it works with his audience. It is a political defense. It's not going to work in any courtroom. Nothing he said in any of those clips has any resemblance to fact or law or truth. It just doesn't. And so it's not going to help him as a defense. Yeah. Everything he says is just a lie. It's perfectly stupid. Here is, uh, I have to ask you what your pin is. I'm seeing you in person for the first time in a long time. I love asking you what your pin is. Tell me what it is. Of course, it's a Chicago hot dog because I love Chicago hot dogs. And the sisters-in-law actually have a fight. Uh, Kimberly says DC hot dogs are the best. And uh -oh. Barbara says Detroit hot dogs are uh -oh. the best. And for our live shows, we each are serving hot dogs. <laughs> so what can I say? Um, I it wasn't bad. I'm willing to try them all just as a neutral observer. I'm just going to volunteer myself as tribute. Jill Weinbanks, it's so good to be in your city. Thank you very much. And Again, these men were repeating a lie. But what's far more concerning was that they were repeating a Russian manufactured lie, willingly, glibly, with clearly zero caution or concern. On May 31st of last year, Senator Grassley and Chairman Comer had a private conversation with FBI Director Christopher Wray, who warned the two of them that the source of their claims was under investigation. And they responded by threatening him with contempt for not making the document public. Nevertheless, they persisted. So why does this all matter? Well... Republicans relied on an informant who is currently being accused of being an agent of disinformation for Russia. Republicans built a case around a man that the Justice Department was so concerned about that they asked a judge to keep him locked up because he might take the six million dollars in cash that he has access to and his Israeli passport, because that's where he's a citizen, and flee to Russia. Surprisingly, despite all of that, a judge did grant Smirnoff's release from custody on Tuesday, but with conditions, a decision that the DOJ so adamantly opposes that they asked the judge to reconsider this morning. Here's the other important part of this. Russia is so determined to undermine our democracy and their democracy at home that they will do whatever it takes from killing opposition leader Alexei Navalny to interfering in our elections. In 2016, both the Mueller report and a bipartisan Senate investigation proved that Russia interfered in the presidential election in a far-ranging influence campaign approved by Vladimir Putin to help elect Donald Trump. In 2020, they sought to do it again, this time making Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, the target of a Russian influence operation aimed at circulating lies about Joe Biden, which he willingly did when Giuliani traveled to Kyiv in 2019 and met with a Ukrainian lawmaker whom the U.S. government later labeled an active Russian agent and sanctioned on grounds that he was running an influence campaign against Biden. Those are the same lies that Smirnov mirrored when he talked to his FBI handler and fed him made-up stories. Sadly, the issue here is that Republicans are repeatedly far too willing to be pawns in Russia's quest to destroy this country and set our democracy on fire. But I guess when you share the same goals, you're more than willing to be Russia's useful idiots. Joining me now is Lev Parnas, former associate of Rudy Giuliani during his scheme to dig up dirt on the Bidens in Ukraine. He is the author of the book, Shadow Diplomacy, Lev Parnas's wild ride from Brooklyn to Donald Trump's inner circle, which comes out tomorrow. And Naveed Jamali, former FBI double agent and host of Newsweek's 
unconventional. Thank you both for being here. I do want to start with you, Lev. Welcome to the show. I just want to walk you, you. with you through your own journey as somebody who was peddling lies like the ones Mr. Smirnoff was peddling. You uh, became a big time donor with a guy named Igor, Levin Igor. People will remember you guys by your first names from that scandal in which you donated a bunch of money to a Trump super PAC, became insiders, and then talk about how you got involved with Rudy Giuliani in trying to market a very similar story to the one Mr. Smirnoff was marketing to the Trump campaign. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Joy. I'm a big fan. I was sure. watching your show Thank from you. the very beginning. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I mean, it was it was a little bit more than just uh, donating. Uh, I built a relationship with a very big uh, Trump lobbyist, uh, Brian Ballard at the time, and a combination between the donations and the relationship with him. Uh, I was able to become a very big insider in Trump Center Circle. Um, I met Giuliani in the summertime of 2018. Uh, when I say met, I really met him. I met him several times previously, but that's when we got uh, pretty close. Uh, we started mm -hmm. uh, spending time every day, and uh, I could tell that uh, you know U Ukraine was always on his mind. At that time, he was looking at Ukraine for the Paul Manafort stuff, the Black Ledger, and certain stuff. And then one evening, uh, we were sitting in the Grand Havana room, and uh, Giuliani got a call from uh, Bart Schwartz, I think it was. It was one of his investigators at the time that was doing uh, research on Ukraine and had some breaking information. He had a whistleblower that was uh, basically telling him information about, you know, Hunter Biden on the board of directors and other information about the Black Ledger. And we were sitting, me and Igor, with him having cigars. Igor was having drinks. And Rudy got off the phone and started like he would usually and start talking about what, you know, he was on the phone with with us. And when he started talking, he started realizing that we knew a lot of the players. We heard a lot of the same information and we were eager to, you know, participate in the conversation uh, within a half an so hour. So wait, let, let me know, just... Let me let me just back yeah. you up for just one second. You were born in Ukraine, right? Back when it was part of the yep. Soviet Union. You are Ukrainian. And so this whole idea, all the black ledger stuff, the allegation was supposed to be that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, when Joe Biden was vice president, were taking bribes to protect this company, Burisma, that Hunter Biden sat on the board of, right? Is that the same Correct. story that you were also peddling? And do you now say that that story was made up? Absolutely. That was the same story. And I've been saying that it was made up for the past four years. Ever since my arrest, I've been screaming at the top of my lungs that it was made up. And not only was it made up, I've also sh shown the world that the people that were doing it were Russian agents that were. And Giuliani never cared. Giuliani never cared. Solomon never cared. Fox News never cared. None of them cared as long as it fit their narrative. Yeah. Uh, and, with, uh, and that was the information that was pushed. And who fed you that story? Uh, it was a bunch of people. Uh, most of them had ties to Russian uh, oligarchs or Russian uh, agents or Russian government officials. Uh, some of them were actual Ukrainian officials that also had ties. But uh, at the end, uh, it was all the same people pushing the same story that was uh, coming from the same source, uh, Russia. Right. And the goal of the story was to make Biden look corrupt so that it would negate Donald Trump's alleged ties to Russia and make it look like Biden was on the take from Ukraine. Is that correct? Oh, that was a combination, yeah. First of all, it was that, but also Trump was so scared of losing to Biden that he thought it would be an embarrassment mm -hmm. that they wanted to seal it by getting Biden out of the race by showing how corrupt it was and not giving him a chance. So let, let me bring you in, Naveed, because you, uh, you know, served as a double agent. You know how this works. Is that how it works, that, that a Russian operative or Russian agent gets to somebody like uh, our friend Lev here and says, hey, this is a story I want you to push. And then it goes into the ecosystem and then that works. But if he, he, if he also has an FBI handler and then he's telling that guy the story, that's a crime, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right on both parts. I mean, Joy, this feels like we've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes. it's it's like WikiLeaks, Car Carter Page, and and all of that rolled into one. You know, for people who maybe just have lived under a rock for the last eight years, I'll say this as I've said it before: for Russia, the Cold War never ended. United States is Vladimir Putin's main enemy. Um, he is seeking to undermine not just democracy. It's not about necessarily putting a thumb on the scale for uh, Biden or Trump, although intelligence assessment says that he prefers Trump. The reality is that he wants to see a weak in the United States. I mean, we talked about the death of, of Navalny, but the other big news that happened this week is that 
it was announced that Russia is trying to put a nuke into space. I mean, this is a man, unlike 2016, unlike 2020, he is at war with Ukraine, losing badly. He is desperate. And this makes him incredibly dangerous. So why wouldn't he try to interfere with the election? Why wouldn't he try to undermine Joe Biden? It just, well, it, you know, it right. just makes total sense with everything we've seen the last eight years. And with Smirnov now out, he has an Israeli passport. Can you understand why a judge would release him when he could just leave or actually be in danger? We've seen Russia target people who it sees as a threat, whether they're in Russia or not. I don't think that he is at risk for being assassinated in the United States and the Russians. There, there are some rules that they play with. Although, again, to your point, they assassinated a defector in Spain just this week. So, um, you know, insofar as why the judge did it, you'd have to ask them. It is certainly, if the DOJ is saying this guy's a flight risk, they believe he's a flight risk. And if he has other passports, you know, it, it, again, it's just, it is crazy to your point, Joy, working with the FBI, that this person would have gotten to that point. You know, they would have vetted him. They right. would have had to confirm. And it's obvious that his lies were easily disprovable, it seems, from reporting. So I, I have to ask the same question you're asking is, how did this yeah. come to pass? Uh, Lev, I, I'm going to give you uh, an opportunity to explain how how easy is it to launder the kinds of stories that you and Rudy Giuliani and Mr. Smirnoff were laundering? How easy is it to launder them to Fox or to Republican members of Congress? Are they just it's like bring them to me? Well, well, I mean, you, uh, usually, I mean, it would be really difficult. But here you had willing participants that wanted the information, looked for it, and, you know, dismantled information that didn't make sense. So uh, they were eager, willing participants. And basically, I mean, look, I mean, Devin Nunez had Derek Harvey be my handler, uh, you know, doing interviews with Ukraine. And then he got up and said he didn't even know who I was, claiming my wife was calling him instead of me. I mean, these people are insane. I mean, they don't want the truth. Uh, they don't. All they want to do is like Comer said, there's a lot of smoke, so there should be fire, but they want so much smoke where you think there's fire, but you can't see because there really is no fire. It's just a mirage. Uh, and that's all they want to do. They want to cause chaos. And, and they knew all along that the, most of the information they're talking about was nonsense. And just think about this, Joy, and they will confirm. I was arrested in 2019. The FBI has had all my information since 2019. I've also given in two, 2020 all the information to the impeachment committee, to the G, uh, RNC, and uh, the DNC. So they all had my information. They saw my communications with Lachevsky from Burisma, where he denied, where I, where Giuliani had me ask him, was Hunter Biden involved? Did Joe Biden receive the money? All of these same questions were uh, Zlachevsky denied. And they knew it and they had it. And why would it take them so long to come up? And another thing is, this is an individual that is being handled, and Naive could probably confirm to this, that is being handled by the FBI. Yeah. He supposed, so he right. had meetings with Burisma, supposedly in 2015, and he overheard this yeah. conversation, but he didn't report in 2015. All of a sudden, he only reported yeah. in 2020 after my arrest and after I came public with all the stuff that they were doing. So, uh, I mean, it's very fishy what's going on in the FD FBI. I mean, even uh, remember David Clark. When David Clark was announced a special counselor, me and my lawyer tried to reach out to him to give him information, to tell him that this information is false. He never returned our phone call. So, you know, uh, you take a look at what it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will read your book with interest, uh, Lev Parnas. I appreciate Thank you, you coming on the show. Uh, Naveed Jamali, always appreciate you, my friend. It is a strange, strange, strange thing, and I think we're going to be uh, following this a lot more as time goes on. Lev Parnas, Naveed Jamali, thank you both.